Hello, veterinary friends. Welcome to the Veterinary Life Coach Podcast. Today, I have a wonderful return guest for you. She's been on the podcast two times now. The last time was in 2022, so it's been a long time. But her name is Dr. Joanne LaFive Connolly. She's a vegan veterinarian, author, and leader of Compassion and Kindness, who empowers all animals and humans to live their best life in balance as one with the web of life. She grew up in Canada and graduated from the University of Montreal Veterinary School in 2001. She specializes in fair medicine for all, end-of-life guidance as a well and grief counselor. Um, After helping her beloved dog Haley pass peacefully and with dignity and the comfort of home in 2007, she created Haley's Angels Veterinary Services and has since helped over 10,000 families say goodbye to their pets at home and find peace and closure. She published her first book in 2011, titled Animal Teachings, and her second book in 2021, titled Animal Teachings 2, from Haley's Angels Methods. They are inspirational guides for better living and better dying for all animals and humans. She teaches to enhance your intuition, to make every everyday decisions for you and your pets to maximize your health, prevent accidents and diseases, and prepare for a peaceful and dignified passing for your loved ones and yourself. She teaches um, animals on the path to live a meaningful life in harmony and balance with your world. Her mission is to redefine society, to create a new, better normal for all animals, humans, and our planet. Oh, welcome to the podcast, Joanne. I think Thank I stumbled you. over yeah. a couple of sentences there, but they were written it as exhausting. Like, like I'm trying to change the and, world. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, you are going to change the world. You are changing. Busy. The world. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. No, that's great. I love it. And you know, if people haven't heard us talk before, we've had two other podcasts together. So if they want to learn more about you, they can go back. I'll have to get those numbers and put them in the show notes. Um, so I can tell them which ones to go to, but anyway, I'm so happy you're here and, um, we're just going to kind of, I think, kind of go all over the place and learn more about you and, and what we can do for people to help them love veterinary medicine more. Right. Yes. That's the goal. Cause, um, it's quite the journey that we signed up for, but (laughs) we're well worth it. Yeah. Well, you started in one place and then ended up where you are now as kind of your own unique niche. And that's kind of what I encourage people to do is find find what they love about vet med and um, make that their career instead of, you know, suffering in silence and just doing things that we think we have to do, right? I, I agree. We're definitely in this time where we can choose and choose not to do certain things and then choose to do what feeds our soul and what we're better at. And, and that's really what life is about feeding our souls every day. Like, so work is not work. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be the labor of love and we need to love what we do and going to work because otherwise it's, it kills us, you know, literally. Yeah. 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 And it almost did you. I I think if I remember (laughs) your story correctly, you got to yeah. There's been a few uh, near death. It seems near death experiences, <laughs> but I here know. I am again. And every time, you know, like every time I feel like, oh God, like this is there we are again. Um, I get a break. I get to recenter. The universe like seems to the stars align, and like okay, next chapter, better, more me, and you know, being you. Like that's that's it. Really, try to be you in your life. That's yeah, advice, you know? that is great advice. Yeah. Well, let me start by asking you what what it is that you love about veterinary medicine. So, you know, I think the best thing, really, my top one is that I get to work in my PJs because <laughs> scrub suits are the most comfortable, simplest clothing. You don't need an ironing board. I just love to roll out of bed, put on PJs, you know, my scrubs, go to work Ups. and we're yeah. done. I mean, it just, life can't get any easier than that. That is a bonus. Yeah. (laughs) We can dress in scrubs every day. Um, But I do love um, making a difference in people's lives. And I'm realizing as I'm getting wiser, you know, um, it, it can be really simple to make a difference and we don't have to spend 
you know, a thousand dollars every time, running a thousand tests, sending everybody to the specialist, because um, that became the trend, you know, with more specialties um, being created. So when I started 23 years ago, there was no specialty or there was like a few board certified orthopedic surgeons. Um, but I remember working with one of them who was the pioneer. So he was, there was no board certification when he became a specialist. So he helped create the specialty. Right. So things have changed a lot and we are, we all feel like forced to refer and do this and do that. And, um, but honestly, we, we can help, you know, we need to remain fair to the animal. So that's like, to me, a big lesson for our profession. Um, we really need to treat the animal, the patient, not the disease itself you know if you have a 14 year old pit bull that's already amazingly alive still and okay might not be perfect but comfort is the key and don't let's not kill him under anesthesia you know like trying to really let's Balance not torture yeah. yeah yeah medical torture and avoid with the unnecessary thing so that's i love to be able to do like preventative medicine or again end of life and really just being fair to the animal so that's probably my biggest passion, putting it all together and being balanced all the way from puppy yeah. to end of life. And how, how would you say you avoid, I mean, I know now because of what you do, you kind of has, have designed your own job, but how would you avoid that fear of not pushing all of the tests and all of the specialists? Because that's what a lot of younger veterinarians are afraid of is that they'll get a board complaint or you know, I think veterinary medicine has gotten um, harder from that standpoint. So how would you encourage people to just look at what the animal needs and the, and the client needs more than what, you know, school told us we need to do? So, and in the last couple of years, since we spoke, I have shifted a little bit to doing a little less euthanasia and a little bit more hospital work because I missed it and opportunities came up. So I'm doing both, but I'm spending a lot of times, like four days a week, full time at uh, at a hospital, and nice. it's just been really good for my soul. So I get to 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 do to experience everything I preach. You know, I I confirm every day that it's the right way to do it. And ultimately, to me, it's bonding with the with the families and the patients. So you know, based on the personality of the dogs, also if you're going to be able to like drain a near hematoma um, without needing full sedation, maybe just a jar of peanut butter, which is like my favorite tool in the hospital is just a jar know, of peanut butter. Awesome, right? um, <laughs> and really distracting these dogs. Um, so we can decide again, what we're going to put them through. And then when you have a few options, you know, or you speak with specialists or nowadays, like young veterinarians have the blessing and the curse of social media and veterinary yes. group. And yes. then you go on there and, oh my God, like, is it helpful? Is it losing you in your thought process because ultimately everybody has a different opinion so you have to go back to how you feel inside and that's where the intuition the gut feeling the again bonding with the the pet owner because people have their own gut feelings and intuition too and some it's like no 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 we can't do this or that um i had a bad experience before like they tell you their trauma and again, based on the pet's personality. So you juggle all this and I I love it. It fascinates me because there is always a clear path. I mean, okay, sometimes it's not like clear, clear, but when you, the more you communicate, um, the more you find the right path for the owners. And my dreams are extremely helpful. Um, I often wake up and as I'm getting older, I'm getting more intuitive and I'll wake up with a list of answers for a few patients that I didn't have the answers the day before. That's um, fascinating. I, I love it. I love yeah. it because it's so helpful. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so I sleep with a piece of paper and a pen, you know, and when I wake up and um, I like, I have ideas as I write everything down. And uh, so that's been great to be able to develop again. We in school were thought to use your brain, but there is so much more. There is the heart, again, the gut feeling, synchronicities. Like yeah. I'll tell you a quick, crazy story, but amazing. So many years ago, I'm I'm being called to go to do a euthanasia for this cat who's like middle age and he's super aggressive. So the owner can't take him to the vet, can't do anything. And he's having some trouble urinating. 
And I'm I'm not really sure what I'm getting into until I go to the house. But there was already red flags because the owner was just all over the place and not sure where to go. And then I go look at this cat and he's very frightened. And by then, as I'm looking at this cat, like I'm in the process of drawing euthanasia solution and my, the top of the bottle breaks, like it shatters. How does oh, that happen? Yeah, like that doesn't happen. doesn't happen. Yeah. So I put the bottle down, I get a little closer to the cat and he pees in front of me and then he runs away. I'm like, okay, let me get a syringe needle. I'm sucking the pee off the floor. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, take yeah. this to your vet. And I followed up with this cat and the vet was so grateful. Um, you know, which says he took over, changed his food. This cat lived, you know, he was a, you know, FLUTD, you know, urinary yeah. issues, but, um, yeah, we didn't have to be euthanized. And like, I was, I'm still having goosebumps. We're so, so close. Sorry. Yeah. So those synchronicities happen all the time where I'm getting guidance and really listening to what's right, what's not right. And people also often will have, again, their own synchronicities, you know, um, seeing like wild animals, bringing them messages or like, oh, I saw a cardinal bird this morning. When I see a cardinal bird, that means my mom is watching me from heaven telling me, you know, this is the right decision or so we find peace. And ultimately, how do we make decisions between the heart, the head, the gut It's whatever you find peace with. And then the the flow of energy, like everything just happens. Like it's clear. The path is, there is no obstacle on it. And, um, and then I follow up, you know, on these patients where sometimes you just don't know you go on, on a gut feeling. So another crazy story is when I worked at the ER, um, this cat came in to be euthanized, she had already been seen by another vet and um, she had a foreign body. They were suspecting, well, I could see the string stuck under her tongue and the people had no money to do surgery. And, but this was a young cat and I'm in the room with them and they're bawling, like they're a young couple and they're talking to me about this cat that's like, it has a mom vibe, like this cat and I'm sitting with the cat and she has a mom vibe and she's so full of love. Like it's not just losing a cat, it's losing like a family member. Right. So I right. tell him, I'm like, you know what? I can't do surgery, but if I'm going to euthanize her and I'm going to sedate her before I euthanize anyway, let me use safer drug to sedate her. And I pulled, that's what I did. And I removed the string from under the tongue. So at least she could swallow it. Right. And I just like we had a nice little ceremony, like everybody, like my staff, we all like we were I was massaging the belly of this cat. We were all like employing all the gods that we believed in. And it will like, pass. Make yeah. this cat pass this string. And sure yeah. enough, she did. Two days later, she was back to normal. And again, goosebumps, you know, because of course, right. then they could have sued me for malpractice. I might have made this cat suffer two more days. But I, right. I told them, I'm like, this is all I've got here but we have a chance and I just don't feel right not giving her that chance. And hopefully she doesn't die in two days of more suffering. Right. right. And she pooped the string. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I love what you say about trusting your gut because I believe that medicine, a lot of it is an art mm -hmm. and you, you, from your past experiences, you have, you have ideas of what you could do from, um, you know, obviously your training, you have a lot of ideas of, of what you can do, but if you do trust your intuition and you communicate well enough with the client, yeah. you can save a lot of pets that you wouldn't think that you could, you know, with the gold standard medicine and yeah. you take it, risks. Yeah. It is a little risk so right. deep down that Mm -hmm. you go with it and you hope yeah. for the best. And it's been a lot of successes. Like I can't even think of one time I felt like, oh, I should not have followed my gut. No, because miracles happen. And if you have like 10 animals, you're taking them all for surgery. They all have the same disease. You all have 10 different outcomes. Yes. So that matters. And so we can't just treat the disease because again, results varies based on the animals, karma, life purpose, right. the bond yeah. with their owner. When are they due to go back to heaven? You know, do we don't control that. Yes. So it's, it's fascinating still to this day. I think that's what makes me the most uh, excited about my job is because I can really tailor it uh, and and filter through my own, you know, like I don't have, luckily I'm in a place right now where I don't really have a boss. Um, I'm by myself, I'm the only vet at the hospital. 
and I don't have that chatter that confuses me or used to confuse me when you have right. a boss. I mean, of course, you learn from other veterinarians, um, but I'm very careful going on social media because yes. I might have a gut feeling Then I go on there and then I'm getting scared because people have other opinions and then I'm like, oh, my God, what if I fail? Um, and so to the young vets out there also, um, just making peace with the fact that you won't be perfect. Yes. But that um, you will be enough most of the time to make a difference. And you have to just hug yourself because if your heart, again, is in the right place, you're trying the best you can, then let it, let go of the results because you really have no control and you have to save yourself at the end. So being stressed of failing, stressed of like you can't survive being stressed all the time of not making the right decision. It, you have to be fearless. Um and just uh, be so passionate that at least you're trying your best. You've read about things. And at the end, you just wing it the best you can because you don't know if if that fracture will heal without surgery. You know, you're it's a puppy. Hopefully it's gonna heal fine. Um and that was another that was another crazy case that I can think of. <laughs> um the surgeon, obviously, the specialist wanted to fix, you know, radius ulna fracture on this puppy's leg. People had no money. And it was a six month old pit bull. And I'm like, you know, we have no choice. Let's bandage it up, yeah. see what happens. These people could not even keep the dog quiet. You know, we had him on trazodone. They wouldn't give it. Like this puppy came back every two weeks with his splint, like total mangled up, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it up. healed. <laughs> like yeah. it healed. <laughs> By some miracle. Yeah, they had good karma. Like it was enough, you know. And it, it, you can't always, again, go by the book. Sometimes you just, you have no options to go by the book. And um, so it was, it was good. Yeah, it's yeah. been good. Well, and that, that's such an important lesson is to realize that not everything's going to go poorly by the book because I, in some of these cases, you would think it would go poorly and not everything's going to go right by the book. Mm -hmm. That's why you can't be perfect. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a life and a, and there's a lot of variables and there's a lot of factors involved and, and you're not God, so you can't control what happens. And, you know, and the just books change. Realize, <laughs> yes. Oh, they've changed a lot over the years, right? <laughs> yeah. Over the years, you know, like this used to be the thing and now, oh no, no, don't do this anymore. And then right? sometimes it goes back to, oh yeah, finally we were right. You know? So, yes. Yeah. Sometimes you were right all along. Yeah. You change. Yeah. 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 So what's a big life lesson? I mean, I know that's a big question, but, and you kind of talked a little bit about some of that, but what, do you have a a case where you learned something really profound that you want to share? So a couple of life lessons, but um, so we talked about the fact that we all, we all will die. So dying with comfort and dignity, that should be the goal, limiting suffering, knowing when to let go, you know? Yes. Um, and then taking good care, as good care of yourself as you take care of your patients, not forgetting your own self. Um, so that's another big one. Um, and ultimately, I think my big, my best realization, uh, most profound, is that the shared love for an animal between the pet owner and the veterinarian, it can make um, any two people bond. You may have nothing else in common as human beings, but you both love that animal and yes. the pet owner wants this animal to live as a veterinarian you want this animal to live and you bond and that's the only thing you bond like if you start talking about anything else in this world you will disagree but yeah. the fact that you can um create magic and when i go to people's homes i see exactly you know what they're about and like um one of my most amazing euthanasia i was me in a group of about 30 uh, bikers, Harley Davidson bikers. And this yeah. dog that I was euthanizing was riding, you know, had ridden for years. Um, I, they showed me pictures like on the front of the bike, wearing the goggles, like this dog was their mascot. Yards. Yeah. And this dog held this group together, you know? And I felt like one of them, I was, I was so out, out of my element, but I was so the right person to be there and it was it lasted like we were there for two hours we're outside bonding we let this dog you know run around like stumbling around you know ate favorite food like it was such an amazing celebration of life 
um there was one of the biker who was a pastor also so it was like a little ceremony a religious ceremony we were all holding hands like it was beautiful and we ended up making clay paw prints for everybody there too so I made 30 wow, clay 30 of them <laughs> and it was it just made me feel so good like it made me feel like a chameleon like I could fit in any situation because I've had other euthanasias where again like um we might not relate on like everything but we love this animal and it we made it go perfect and it was divine and I love yeah. it I love yeah. it well, I think it's such a privilege. I, people ask about this a lot when you're a vet about the euthanasia thing, you know, and I know you do that for a living. And so I know you see the value in it and you see that it's a beautiful experience. Um, but I like to convey that to lay people that don't know anything about vet med and also veterinarians that doing a euthanasia to me is a, a big privilege. Like it's something that we get to do, not something that we have to do. And I think well, that yes. if because you can if you have, don't that, have that option, you're suffering. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it, and is it hard? Yes. It's sad sometimes because you take on those emotions of the client, but it's such, I mean, I've had some of my most beautiful experiences with people or memorable, you know, in a euthanasia situation or, or you bond with those people and then they bring their pets to you for the rest of their lives. And it's just, it's really something that I think you have to look at in in a different way in order to appreciate it. Like, how did you come to really appreciate that part of your job, the euthanasia part and do the, the um, Haley's Angels? Well, again, I felt like it was a privilege to die with dignity and not to suffer. Um, so it was a no brainer when Haley, who was 14 years old, had trouble breathing. I'm like, well, what, op what other options do we have? Like she's at the end of her life and loyalty. These dogs are so loyal to us, our, our animals that often they won't let go. You know, they fight for us. Right. And even if you tell them, you know, it's okay to let go. I mean, some pets won't go. So having the privilege to help them, it's huge. And after Haley passed, that was my first experience of feeling a push from the universe from from heaven you know I, it was the first time in my life where i felt like there was truly somebody haley's spirit pushing me because the path for the home euthanasia opened up and the flow it was just flowing and people one person started you know called me to go help her dog and it was just snowballing before my eyes so i had to jump on board because even though i was scared and we talked about that but um it became like such a privilege and more people realize it any even like even uh religious people that may not have had those experiences so at first they they think you know it's a sin or they struggle with their belief system but then they realize that god there is no sin there like we're helping we're not letting someone suffer right. so more and more people want that for themselves as well um so it's powerful um, yeah yeah. How would you, how would you tell younger veterinarians that are either in vet school or getting ready to go into vet school or just graduating, like in their first years of of uh, practice, to prepare themselves for that part of the job? Well, right now I would say read my books because <laughs> that's why I wrote them. <laughs> yeah. Um, to really give my insights because no nothing in vet school prepares you. I mean, maybe now they have some classes about you know euthanasia end of life but i felt the need to share my own experiences so the the two books are filled with stories and experiences so so veterinarians can really figure out for themselves like what they're comfortable doing and um based on their own personalities too and then go with that because you have the options of never going to someone's home if it's not for you you can be in the hospital you can you don't even have to have clients you can work for a reference lab and read slides all day long right. so you have so many options that you need to really not feel bad for not being who you think you should be like just you're you be honest with yourself in uh, don't be afraid of just listing who you are and what your needs are because you have no choice you must honor your needs and feed your own soul and not be forced into doing anything that makes you upset inside there's no point 
there's just none. Right. Right. And you can write your own life story. Like you can decide what you want to do. If yeah. you never want to do with euthanasia, or if yeah. you only want to do surgery, there's so many options in vet med. And that's why I love it so much. It's such a, yeah. And it can change too. So profession. this one life chapter, you know, okay, I won't do this, but then you grow, you mature, you have different experiences. Then you realize, oh, you know, I'm attracted to this now. Maybe I'm going to do this. And this is kind of how life goes. It's a series of chapters and it's, it's beautiful. I agree with you. You know, being vegan has helped me in my career too, because I felt less guilty because I, you know, of, of eating animals and the yes. first, it took a while, you know, I was already like six, I had graduated like six years before. Um, and then it hit me and when Haley died, it hit me all at once. I kind of revamp my whole life I was looking at my life and I'm like you know I don't want to be this person anymore and I started making changes becoming more eco-friendly um getting you know bamboo sheets uh, bed sheets as opposed to cottons because bamboo grows fast uses less water like yeah. wow getting me out of a depressive state like so quickly by making just living more mindfully and um real I just wanting to step lightly on the earth so little pieces adds up every day. You know, I'm realizing something else that, oh, I can do this too. That's so much fun. You know, we're recycling at work, which a lot of practices before I never saw anybody recycle. I would talk to my bosses. Oh yeah, it sounds good, but whatever, like too complicated. Like now that I'm able to make decisions, I'm like, hey, we're recycling and all the cardboard boxes, like, no, they're not going in the trash. And that's helping me also um, be happy and live a life and have a career that's that makes sense to me. It aligns with your, the, yeah. with, with your beliefs. Yeah. 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 I think staying true to your morals and your values yeah. and beliefs is so important. You know, yeah. my first job, it didn't align with, with my values and it, and it didn't work out for that reason. So, you know, I, I always tell young veterinarians, I'm like, you have to make sure that where you're working aligns with who you want to be and who you are, yeah. you know, in whatever fashion. So what if, um, this is going to change a little bit of the subject, I think, but it just occurred to me to ask this now. Um, what if veterinarians are struggling with things that have happened in the past? Cause you know, I coach a lot of veterinarians to get over, you know, like I'm afraid of surgery because I had this one dog die, or I'm afraid to face clients because a client yelled at me and you know, that past trauma that we're experiencing. And I know you talk about, you know, how to rewrite the past traumas. I think that was one of the things that, um, so yeah. there's a few steps I would say first. So first is looking at what happened and see where, you know, you could have done better and maybe you wanted to do better, but you followed somebody else's advice and that puts you in trouble. Um, so yeah. being honest with yourself in, what you knew you wanted to do different, but you didn't. And then the lesson is, okay, I'm listening to myself. I I get others' opinions, but at the end, it's my feeling and I follow my feeling. Yeah, and that's um, really hard to do, especially if you're a young vet working with older veterinarians. I found that- I know, but I they, they put me in career. trouble too. Yeah. And I was a young vet I re oh. and that's when it clicked for me yeah. because I had an, in I had a, I was an intern. I was working with specialists. Yeah. And I remember like it was yesterday and I wanted to do you know, this one thing, this one treatment for the dog. And then, you know, of course, I don't trust myself a hundred, like I haven't been out of school a year. <laughs> so, right, right. Um, but you never, the, the people, the other colleagues that you're asking to never have the full picture. They don't meet with the owner. They don't, they don't sense, you know, what the pet needs, the pet's personality. They don't have that vibe, you know, that you're getting, you get right. the whole picture. Yes. So, um, so again, giving yourself a big hug for not doing everything that you wished you had done. And again, we're not perfect, um, but you can also, so you you should rewrite. And this is good for pet owners also. Like I had one lady, her, the euthani her pet died and she missed the opportunity to euthanize. So she felt really guilty. And I told her, rewrite the scenario, how you wished how you really wanted it to happen because she didn't right. want her dog to suffer and um and she she did that and so again any of us who go through trauma rewrite the story the way you wish it had happened if it's in your childhood and you were being bullied or your uh, sisters or brothers you know were mean to you 
ultimately um, forgiving them for for not being able to do better and rewriting the story like you wanted it, like you deserved it because you deserve, you know, love and compassion. And even if other people didn't give that to you, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Um, if you make a mistake, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. So showing yourself compassion and rewriting the story like it should have happened, like you wanted it to happen. Because they say the brain doesn't know what's true and what's not true. So you can convince yourself, you can heal by saying, okay, this is my new past and I deserve that past. You know, I'm a good person. I have skills um, and really building up on that and giving yourself that that forgiveness that nobody else might be able to. And if if there is um an angry pet owner or an angry family member that you have and you can't really talk to them because they uh, choose to not forgive you or to stay mad, you can still write them a letter and write a letter to their soul. And I find that really helpful because you're kind of, you're not writing the letter to the angry human who's struggling and who has their own weaknesses and battles and trauma. You're writing the letter to their soul, the the spirit that uh, is detached and would forgive you ultimately, you know, once the spirit detaches from the body, let's say, and it's in heaven, well, that spirit would forgive you for sure, because nobody is perfect. And that person who's mad is sure not perfect. They've had their own, they've made their mistakes. So we're all even on, you know, we just need to, um, again, forgive, but writing the letter to that person saying, look, I really didn't mean to hurt your pet, uh, to hurt you, you know, um, so I find that super powerful. You, you're shifting the energies related to that incident and you can move past it. I love that. That's that's really a good exercise, I think. It, I've not heard somebody present that, but I think that would be very valuable to, you know, just kind of a good way to let it go and, and change it. And also if uh, the person or the pet uh, is past, and, you know, you have guilt again, or any uh, conversation you couldn't have, you do the same thing. You write the letter to that pet. And if you feel like you failed this animal, you write him a letter. And of course, you're going to get some synchronicity, some dreams, you know, you're going to feel that this, this pet is forgiving you because you've tried your best. You've given your soul, you know, you've, your heart was in the right place when something bad happened, but um, you and you're learning from that because that's what life is about. It's learning and growing. Um, we were not born knowing everything. Believe me, I wish. <laughs> yeah. We're the hardest. It takes a long time, field. right? And you still don't know everything. No, and when we will never. It's tough. It's tough to accept that you'll never right. know everything. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's so much to learn. Yeah. So you said something before um, in in the email that you sent me. Um, when we were talking about what we want to talk about, and I kind of want to, since you were speaking about heaven and writing letters to your, to people or, or to um, pets in heaven um, about being in heaven and answering questions to help you get the most out of your life now. So that's another exercise. Yeah, we can do um, in the sense that we remember that we'll be dead soon, like just living with that. <laughs> pressure <laughs> knowing that some hey, of us sooner than others right yes <laughs> the older um, I get the more I'm like oh I'm gonna be dead soon <laughs> so do it now like yeah, who do you yeah. want to be and right so this this current chapter like that I'm spending more time at the hospital I am um yeah like fearless I'm just like speaking up um I want to setting boundaries <laughs> yes I just like things that are dear to me that I know are helping the animals even though they've never been done let's say or yeah. I'm just like, hey, we're going to try this out, you know, and yeah. it's a lot of fun. It, it's just it's a lot of fun because I'm I have a I had a 90, 92 year old uh, great great aunt who died not long ago. And um, that's what she would say. It's like, hey, how do you get to be 92? It's one day at the time, um, just seizing the day. And don't think about tomorrow because you don't know how long you have. Like she's like, I didn't know I would live to be 92. Right. But it's always just giving it all you have each day, like it's your last day and uh, being present. And um, so any idea, don't die with your ideas. Like mm -hmm. it needs to it, try it out, share it, speak up. Yeah, and, I like that. Don't die with your ideas. Yeah. That's a good quote. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's awesome. I love quotes. So when somebody says something interesting, I, yeah. I love to like write that down with your ideas. Yeah. So do you have, if people are not very open to that way of thinking, do you have any advice for them? How do you open yourself up to that way of thinking? If you're very stuck in the worry, you know, like anxiety is a big thing for a lot of us where we worry about everything that's already passed. And then we also worry about anything that's going to happen that kind of like chronic anxiety. How do you work your way out of that? You have to realize that you have no control over how people anything. respond. Yeah. So you could think you're perfect and you're, you're taking action and you're so proud of yourself. You think you like, Hey, I nailed this. I went by the book, whatever. Like I did right. everything. I, mm -hmm. and then the pet owner decides to be upset for whatever reason. And you're yeah. like, God, can't you see how much sweat and tears, like energy I put into doing this? And I, it looks perfect from my perspective, but yeah. somebody else, you have no idea where they're coming from. And uh, they might be upset because of my accent, which has happened a few times. Really? <laughs> yeah. And they just don't want to see me. And I'm like, oh my God. And at first it hurt me. Um, right. Because I'm like, I'm like, hey, I'm such a good vet. Like I'm able to help your pet more than somebody with a different accent who has your right. accent, you know? Right, exactly. So it was really hard to swallow to realize that, but I'm past it. And I'm like, you know what? I am full of love and killing with kindness, always trying to um, really be proud of myself. And that's, those are some of my dad's words, you know, don't worry about the opinion of others the only opinion that matters about yourself is your own what you think of your own self so don't worry because you have no control what people are going to decide to say about you and your true. happiness might piss them off which i used to have a roommate and she told me that once she's like god you're so happy all the time it just really pisses me off i love that and i'm like okay well yeah thank you because it's freeing me to not bother to not worry anymore and to just live my life and I'm very, I'm a visionary, you know, I have, yes, I have crazy ideas sometimes, but they all, they work. And so I've gotten used to being different. And when people are not able to take it because it's destabilizing to them because they do need the book and all that their life will be is part of what's in the book. You know, they can't yeah, think like the research, doing different things. Right. Um, I'm very out of the box. Like there is no box in my life. I'm just like, I used to work in shelters. I mean, you have to be creative. Um, my parents are very out of the box. Just, hey, try new things. Let's, yeah. it, and it's fun. I love that creativity. Yeah, it's a free spirit. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, yes, sometimes you feel like you're going to fall off the cliff. Like you're on the edge all the time. Like my life is just on the edge. Um, but it's, it's great. And you learn to, uh, I mean, it's been good. It's been positive. I've been scared many times. But hey, it's working out. And if sometimes you you think a mistake happened, like for example, the story that comes to mind, I, I my client so um they brought me this dog that was really old, had really nasty tumor, and I could tell it was spreading already. Like the rest of her skin had little bumps. Yeah. But um, this dog was super happy, and the bad, the big chunk was oozing, necrotic. You know, it was just like sm smelling all over the house. Yeah. So they convinced me to remove it and it dehissed because it was, you know, really big. But so at first I was really bummed that it dehissed. I'm like, oh, I made a mistake, you know? Yeah. Even though the odds were against me completely, like who right. would go into that in the first place? But I just right. felt like we could, I I felt Buy again, dog some time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, buying some time, quality yeah. of life. Um. So when the wound dehissed, so they were forced to come into the hospital um, on it for an unplanned visit and the lady brought in her son and this was the blessing the silver lining of all this I realized that oh my god thank god this wound dehissed because her son became involved he was like seven years old and we got to talk about preparing for euthanasia we had to we got mm -hmm. to talk about so many things it right. prepared this the son to losing his dog Stock, and if the wound yeah. didn't dehiss, we would not have, he would have been taken off guard. Um, right. But so again, a few weeks go by and I ended up at their house 
and it was the son's birthday and like the timing of everything. And this, this kid, you know, this child was Zen. And I was looking back at, okay, me beating myself up for making a mistake. This mistake right. needed to happen. It opened the to door there, to so yeah. much good. These yeah. people were so grateful. Like it, from their point of view, I, w- I was perfect. Right. You know, so it just shows you how, yeah, judge yourself as hard as you want, but you have no control. And so be kind to your own self and just let things go. Uh, yeah. The way it's being happened. open to what happens. Yeah. 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 Tell me your horse allergy story, because this is something <laughs> that you kind of mentioned. And I was like, really, I want to hear about this. So, so I've, I you know I grew up with my mom being a naturopath and always searching for answers about why we get sick, why accidents happen to different people, different animals. So I talk about those things in my books. And I have grew up with really bad horse allergies. And when I was in vet school, I could barely finish my rotation. Like my eyes would just swell up, tear up. My nose would be all congested, runny. It was terrible. So I'm talking to my mom. Uh, we're having casual lunch and we're talking about, God, you know, why am I having such bad allergies? And I see because I'm, you know, become more intuitive. So I see in my mind this short um, movie of me living as a Native American and watching white men capture wild horses, our wild horses. We lived in a tribe and I burst into tears. And it was like, this was part of my past, not in this lifetime, but in a previous life. And I have a lot of, my lifestyle in this lifestyle, like I relate much more to the Native American lifestyle. So I'm always, you know, one with the earth. And um, so it made sense to me. I, I believe strongly, like I feel it in my the deepest part of my soul that I did live as a Native American. Um, so the sto- the movie that I saw made a lot of sense that this was why I became allergic to horses. Because every time I see a horse, my my um, sub my subconscious mind is reacting to again, crying, crying, emotional shock of being separated from these wild horses that became slaves. Yeah. And it would be more, even I started like, if I saw horses in stalls, you know, prisoners, like I would react way more than if we, the horses were outside. Interesting. Yeah. So I, my allergy stopped that day. Once you realize that. I, yes. Um, and I be, so I knew my whole life, I knew I was going to adopt a horse and, um, the time came after we talked about it, after we moved from Arizona to Florida and this horse found me and my neighbor, first time I spoke with her, she's like, Hey, are you ready for your horse? Cause I know who he is and everything kind of snowballed. And I was never allergic to that horse. And, but I needed a horse. I needed to, to heal some more from that trauma. Um, and then when this horse needed to go to heaven, I told you the story as well, where I had a dream about him telling me that he was, he needed to be home free. We were flying in heaven. He was a magnificent white horse with wings. Um, and he was in his angel body. And right. that morning I went to the barn, he had chronic illness. So that day it was clear he needed to be helped. And it was like one of the hardest euthanasia I had to do. Um, but I felt peace that he had told me that it was time. So we're so connected and there are so many messages that come across um, when we start again, listening and looking for answers again, of why, why are accidents happening and uh, why are diseases getting to us, you know, because we're out of balance. We again have emotional shock, trauma and, or um, like road accidents. If you tell yourself, if you, If people offer you to go on this trip and you really don't want to go, but you're going against your will, anything you do against your will, you become at risk of trauma because Mm. the universe will get you back on track and say, hey, you don't belong there. What are you doing? So be you and dare to just dare disappointing others because you need to not disappoint yourself. That's the most important key for survival. Otherwise, you pay the price. You end up hurt. You end up sick. And and then you you beat you you're upset at your own self because you knew better, right? Um, yeah, that's we've talked about people pleasing a lot in the last yeah. few episodes of my podcast, and and that's a good reason not to people please because it's not. And I authentic. know, but it's hard. You know, I'm like I want to please everybody. Oh, me too, for sure. 
I know we want everyone so, to like us, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a big lesson when you're like, hey, I'm really sorry, but no, I'm not going to go because now I'm definitely I'm so aware that um, I think at first you can get away with with things that now I can't get away with because I'm I'm aware. It's like, OK, right. now, like if you're if you don't listen to you like this is basic, just follow what your heart tells you. Yeah, your um, intuition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's been yeah. working well for me. So I share it in the book. I share many stories, um, how other people got hurt also, and they share their stories with me and when what they learned authentic. They learned, so yeah, when they weren't authentic to themselves. Yes. So yeah. what else do you want to share today? I know we're going to do this again. We already talked before we got on the podcast that we're going to try to do a podcast from Florida when I'm down there, because mm -hmm. I'll be down there in the winter and I'm going to go, go meet in person, which will be really fun. But hey, then you'll see, um, you know, when I talk about balance, um, your environment needs to suit you as well. And it, it might suit you for one life chapter to live in the cold, let's say, but yes. maybe Florida will hug you so tight and won't let you leave. Um, and it might become, okay, new chapter. This is my new me, you know? Yes. Um, so it's important. Yeah, that was, for everybody. That's a struggle for me still, because I've only been down there the last couple of winters for a good chunk of time. You know, I live in Michigan and it's miserable here in the winter. So there's really no reason to be here if you can have the opportunity to go south. But um, but you're right. It's the chapter and the, you know, learning to belong and accept where you are and make the best of it kind of thing. Yeah, because I have a lot of friends from my hometown who thrive in the winter. They feel alive, which was totally not me. And that's why I had to leave. Yes. But if you like snowmobiling, skiing, you know, sure. like some people truly come alive. They go camping in minus yes. 40 degrees. In the cold, I know. <laughs> Not for me. So, um, yeah, just figuring out where you belong now in this chapter. And then the answer yes. can change as you grow and get older. Um, but that, I find that fascinating. So I talk about that, too, in the second book. Um, there is a lot of questions for people to answer to really assess where they're at with their own life and making sure we don't lie to our own self because in order to please others, because that's always the, yeah. 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 People pleasing yes, uh, is a lie, right? Yeah. And saying yes, when you really want to say no is also a lie. Yes. Yeah. So do you, I know you have, you like quotes. Did you prepare some quotes for us yes. today? I've got I like quite them. a few. So okay. um, my dad is uh one of my greatest source of inspiration. So I'll start with a quote from him. I love that. Is your dad still with you? Yes. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. we. Sh uh, he's awesome. Really. Yep. Um, I love that. We have such a good relationship. So um, he, uh, he does not, um, he does not fit in the box and he lives on the edge a hundred percent. So I learned really? a lot from watching him go. So you came by it naturally. <laughs> yeah. And he loves to travel. So yeah, I'm just the, yeah, the, the, the logical, you know, next step that would right. come out of somebody like him. But yeah, so his quote is <laughs> all the rules and laws can be changed because they are all man-made. So common sense, common sense must prevail. They're changing anything that doesn't make sense in this world. <laughs> oh, that is a good one. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then second quote is life's greatest victory is to fall in love with your own self, mm. uh, with all of yourself, your mind, your strengths, your weaknesses, your unique traits that make you think you're crazy or different, you know, your body, all the billions of body parts and cells that work together to keep you alive. Just fall in love with all of it. Um, yeah, I think that's really life's greatest victory. Yes, that is. I agree. Um, and so being alone doesn't have to feel lonely. I like that because I'm a loner and um, I, I do my best thinking, you know, again, it's good to be around people, but then right. you have to really center and then decide, okay, this is which, where I'm going. Right. And you can only do that when you're alone. And again, it doesn't have to feel lonely at all. Um, it's powerful to be alone. Yes. Yep. Um, uh, your only competition should be with yourself to be a better person today than you were yesterday. That's it. Yeah. Don't try to impress anybody. Just try to impress your own self. I love that. I think Jordan Peterson says something like that, but it's basically like competing with yourself, not others. And, you know, not, I think the social media is get is what gets us to want to compare to everyone. 
And it's yeah. so, it's so not useful. No, it's not. Um, because we all come from such a different place. And so that leads to the next quote, you are the hope and the dream of your ancestors. And I love mm, that. That's a good one for you, for sure. Because you're, yeah, yeah you're next, you know, they've done the best yeah. they could and now you're it. So right. like we said, don't die with your ideas. If you have a vision, I mean, this is it. It's now or never because right. be yeah. so you'll run out of it. time. Right. Think about your ancestors that are, that are cheering you on. Yes. Um, to really be the best you can be. Yeah, that that's really powerful because if you even if you think back like one or two generations, we have have so much more than like my grandma who had to quit school in 8th grade because her dad made her work on the farm. Yes. And she always was sad about that. Is yeah. she wanted to be a nurse and she could never yeah. be a nurse and she used to say that to me. So when I w became a veterinarian, she was so thrilled. And it's just, you know, she was only my, just my grandmother, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's amazing. And my last quote is, um, we are the animal's biggest threat and also their biggest hope. So you decide which one you want to be the animal's that. biggest threat or their biggest hope. Biggest hope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should talk to you about my turkey problem that I'm having in my backyard. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I have a flock of turkeys that has taken over my backyard. Like there's probably at least 30 of them and they're flying up in my tree and pooping all over my deck and ruining my furniture. And, <laughs> and it's so That's funny because I'm so thrilled when I see them, like I love them so much, but then I'm cleaning up Turkey poop every day and it's driving me crazy. So I totally so get funny. the poop, but <laughs> um, your, your yard must be so homey. They feel the love and they feel safe there. They're hilarious because, you know, my husband keeps trying to figure out ways to scare them away out of it, just to the one tree. And I'll even go talk to them. I'll say, hey, ladies, get out of there. You're pooping on my deck. But they don't listen to me. So can you put a roof? I would put a roof above your deck. We're going to have to. Yeah. yeah, that's, I think, our next step because they're they just, so happy. At least, you know, well, that I wouldn't hurt them like there's they're but living the life. You know, yeah, they definitely they're are safe. there. They're hilarious. I even went out there last night with my dog and my dog just kind of wagged his tail and looked at him and they were like, whatever. They didn't, they were oh my God. Them. Yeah. You so. could borrow my dogs. The turkeys will be gone, but I'm so glad for these turkeys that they don't have to worry about the dog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. My dog just looked at him like, well, what are these giant birds in our yard? For? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. Well, I really appreciate you being here. It's so much fun. It goes by so fast every time I talk to you and I have yeah. lots more, I'm sure lots more things we can talk about. So we'll get together this winter. Yeah. And we'll that's one in person, we'll come up with some ideas or you can just yeah. talk more about all the things you like to talk about. And I, I'm interested that you're back in the clinic because last time I talked to you, you were just doing your home euthanasia practice. So I'll have to hear that story. Hey, balance. Oh yeah. And it's a good story too, but is we'll it next winter? It's Do a you want to save story. it? Okay. Yes, because it's long, but it's Is it's it? crazy. You won't okay. even believe your All right. Well, you remind me when we get together yeah. next time that we have to tell that story to everybody that's okay. listening. So yeah. All right. So this is Dr. Joanne Connolly, and she is an amazing person. Tell them where you can they can find you. Your website. Um, my website, then you can have access to all social media. So Haley's Angels.com, www.haleys. A N G E L S dot com. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for listening. And if you have any questions for Joanne or me, or you want to uh, want us to answer some more things on our next podcast together, just put it in the comments or send me an email um, at J a capel DVM at gmail.com. And uh, we'll get to it. That's exciting. I can't wait. Yeah. All right. Have a beautiful week, everyone. Bye. Bye, Joanne.